Thank you very much. Well, I first of all thank you so much for inviting me. ACK. It has been held uh, in the city of uh, Kyoto. This is a wonderful format, unique format. That's how it started. And I think this year marks the third year. Every year, along with the ACK, um, many people visit my studio. I have been working at the Kyoto University of the Arts. And when I was uh, the student there, uh, this kind of international art event have never heard of. When I was a student, I thought uh, how I can be or could be an artist uh, after graduating from the uh, university. I thought of that often and then thinking that now this international uh, art event has been so um, frequently held, uh, it's, a, it's a great change. I have a studio named uh, Sandwich. I have that uh, studio in the city of Kyoto, and I would like to share uh, with you uh, about uh, this uh, studio. So this is uh, the Sandwich studio. F about 15 uh, years ago, I found the land. Uh, this uh, is located in Fushimi ward of the city of Kyoto, along with the Uji Gawa River. Uh, it used to be the factory making sandwich. Very old uh, factory it was. A uh, belt conveyor and eight huge uh, refrigerators were there uh, in that old factory. And so at that time, there was another uh, Kyoto University uh, for the art uh, uh, work. And uh, now we call the Kyoto University of the Art. And uh, at that time, together with other students, I renovated uh, this place uh, to make uh, other place for the artists that uh, could do their artwork activities. Uh, my sculptures, I also do the architectural works. And so this is a nearby river. And uh, also there is a bridge called Hangetsukyo and Ginganbashi, the bridge. And there are three studios. Uh, so gradually, um, we have expanded the sites. Uh, the architects, artists, and then contemporary dancers, as well as the musicians, uh, get together from the different Jan Lu people get together. And we generate a various kind of a, a gener creation. So this is uh, uh, the view where we started the re renovation. Actually, I made it into uh, the so-called ultra project, renovation project uh, of the university. So my students and the uh, uh, the architects that uh, that are uh, acquainted with me, we uh, got together and then discussed how we can make this place so unique. Actually, from here, we can change the art scene of Kyoto City, not just closing uh, this place. But I, I wanted to make this uh, place as a platform open to everyone. We say uh, the creative platform where everybody can get together. All the creators uh, can get together. And then through the various uh, projects, we can dispatch what we have to the rest of the world. That was uh, the uh, initial concept. So manually, it has been a, a lot of hands-on project. But today, we have um, full-time staff members. Uh, 50 people come. And so gradually, expansion took place. And this is also the architecture, the office, a professional office for the architectural work. Not just architectural design, but we see the fusion of architecture and then art. Not, you know, designing from the hardware uh, standpoint. We wanted to have a software approach, hands-on experiences there. So I am the artist. So how uh, the relationship between art and uh, city design uh, we've been discussing a lot to come up with something which is unique. And sculpture is another area. This is a painting as well, paintings or 
prints or installation or the films, whatever the format, you name it, whatever that you learned. For example, uh, the sculpture was uh, the specialty area when I was at the university. I wanted to do uh, more uh, the different uh, Jean Lu uh, branch out from the spa sculpture experience by having the gravity force. Um, the painting is uh, created with the drops of the ink, so it's different uh, way of painting uh, using the brush. And then this is a machine. The, uh, the ballpoint pen is uh, captured at the edge of the machine, and then the machine draws a line. And this uh, is uh, the collaboration uh, with the uh, Osaka, the art uh, gallery, come up with uh, some print work. And at uh, the uh, Tokyo, uh, the Museum of the Art, uh, we had the big uh, exhibition. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, the museum uh, show of a great uh, deal. So uh, we put the drop uh, of the paint and then 50 meter, the length of the papers were painted. And this is agricultural field. On that uh, field, uh, we come up with this sculptural work. This is another work, Kawakubole, uh, the designer of uh, uh, Kawakubole, uh, the office. Uh, they said that they are going to do something uh, with their shop in Ginza, and then White Palace is the name of this artwork. So the pipe is rotated, and on top of it, we uh, put the plug, and then with the um, centrifugal, the force, like uh, creating the roll cake, we come up with the sculpture. We have a 3D model. Uh, from 3D model to architecture, from 3D model to something. 3D technology has been developed in our uh, studio. And I personally uh, come up with this idea of coming up with a sculpture uh, with a 3D model technology. So uh, whatever that is uh, created uh, in the computer uh, from the small scale or the large scale, uh, without uh, any limitation in terms of the size, uh, you come up with this sculpture or the art uh, in the space available. When it comes to the sculpture, you think about something solid, uh, stone or uh, wood, you name them. But as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to the sculpture, the material, through the material, the sense and ideas uh, can be transmitted. It is the media. Hands-on experience media can be fluid, it can be mist. Uh, various uh, material can be uh, used as a media. So the uh, sculpture, uh, 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 this, uh, the idea of the sculpture should be elevated more. So this is uh, the paper where the water cannot be absorbed and with the air force, uh, the e, paint uh, can be explored like this. And internet, whatever is gathered in the internet, and then through the lens, the object can be seen. We call this pixel. Uh, so when I started to use the internet uh, for the first time in the university, I thought of this. Internet is actually covering uh, the city creating the high level uh, of the advanced uh, uh, society. At that very beginning, that was a beginning phase, I thought of uh, why not express that uh, in the sculpture, and I call this uh, work as pixel. Uh, this is uh, the drawing uh, uh, with the pandrum, and uh, I myself there are nine art universities in Kyoto, and I've been teaching three out of nine universities. I have a, a good network of the young artists. And uh, when I see uh, the uh, graduate uh, young people graduating from the colleges, I wanted to create a place where they can be uh, uh, active. And uh, in the Kyoto city, in the building, uh, the Starbucks asked me to create the drawings on the wall, but it's everywhere in the world. It's nothing so exciting. So I, 
ask them that Starbucks space be openly available to everyone. So I asked all the uh, young artists in Kyoto and then bring your artwork, I asked them. And then all of a sudden, uh, you can see uh, the unique and only one Starbucks in the world with this kind of artworks. Basically, artists uh, conquered, controlled the entire Starbucks. My graduate students and also newly graduate students are here as well. And they are now very well-known artists. They started their career here, and some of them are globally known, developed into a globally known artists. This is the creation of a space. The name of this shop is this is nature, selling sake and other items. I did art direction and also I provided some art items here. Outside in the garden, here is a sculpture. In France, there is a island called Segan. I provided the same kind of sculpture there. And this is an hotel. At each room, we have an art pieces. 200 artists participated in this project to have their exhibitions. This is the sculpture I introduced in June. This is 25 meters high. And I'm standing in um, beside my sculpture. You can see how big this sculpture is. This is a permanent exhibition here. Fitting sculpture into a city takes time, and there are many things that you have to consider, like the context of the location, and also what should be there in that particular place in the city. I had to think about the relationship between the city and the art piece. The fact that this is a permanent sculpture is that this will continue to exist even after I die. So I had to think about so many different things to install this sculpture here. Here, uh, there are silicon oils falling down continuously. This is to visualize the gravity. This is a manifold. This is a sculpture 16 meters high made of aluminum. This is located in Korea. These are all very big sculptures like uh, um, buildings by using uh, the knowledge of the architecture, I created this uh, sculpture by utilizing my human network. This is based on body scan of many different people. This is my piece from 12 years ago. Body 3D body scan was not very uh, available around the world, but now you can do body scan by using your iPhone. This is right after East Japan earthquake. I created sculpture from the um, the collapsed buildings of the earthquake. Uh, the name is Sean. In two thousand eight, I created uh, this very big sculpture, and this is now exhibited at Rubu Museum at the pyramid. In Kyoto, there are many workshops of traditional uh, art crafts. Artistic technologies developed in Edo uh, era are still available in Kyoto. These kind of traditional and old technologies or techniques are used in this sculpture. This is a, techno a technique called um, gold uh, coating. 
this was originally from Egypt and、uh, exported to Japan. And Kyoto has a lot of potential because in Kyoto we have both new things and old things overlapping with each other. Not only new things, but also we have old techniques and technologies. So this is a very culturally rich place. This is from the last year.、Uh, we have bubbles on the silicon oil. In Hiroshima, I developed this sculpture called Kote. Those are the examples of the pieces I created. I collaborate with contemporary artists. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much,、uh, Kohei.、Um, just for the audience's、um, information, I'm Aaron Cesar, director of Delfina Foundation, and I'm going to ask a few questions, kind of, of Kohei, following his presentation, and then I'll introduce Greg, our next、uh, speaker, and then we'll repeat this with different、um, moderators taking over throughout the course of this talk.、Um, it's an experiment. We might make a few mistakes here and there, but we'll try our best.、Um, Kohei, I'm. Very kind of interested in the metaphor of a sandwich, knowing that your studio has taken that name from the previous use, kind of 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 the building. In terms of a sandwich being many different layers coming together to provide some kind of nourishment, and in my work at Delfina Foundation, we often talk about nourishing artists, and that's what sandwich. Uh, your studio, your organization, is doing very much of international residencies is something that's very close to me and our work at Delfina Foundation. But it's also one of the layers of your sandwich, at Sandwich.、Um, so I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about the international residencies that、uh, that you are also hosting. And the importance of them, you know, in Kyoto in particular, and also let's say also in Japan, in terms of thinking about the title of this talk, which is building ecosystems. Uh, let me answer in Japanese. Thank you very much for your que question. The name sandwich. Is to show the idea that we are going to create something together. We have a residence in the sandwich, and I myself was living there at the beginning of the sandwich. IKEA had provided four double bunk beds. So eight people can have bed in this room. So in the past fifteen years, we received about three hundred artists, including photographers from around the world, and they participated in this project. Now we have three from Brazil, and. When I had an exhibition at Japan House in Brazil, I offered them a place in Sandwich, and also we have five students from Bangladesh, from around the world. We have connections and offering spaces. That's our residency program at Sandwich Residence. We have. A space for six people, and we also have an apartment at Antenol, and we also have a residence near King Kakuji Temple. We have various residence programs. In addition to being kind of an artist, and you know, of course, sandwich, you also teach. And I wanted to ask about the difference between what is formal education, which takes place in universities. And what's informal education, which takes place at Sandwich,、um, around the world, I think universities 
uh, help individuals learn how to make art, but not necessarily how to be an artist. It's something you learn from often your peers. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the community of Sandwich and mm. what it's creating and how it's helping artists to flourish? Mm. People at Sandwich It makes me very emotional, but there are many people who are very unique. They are very unique in their personality and they have many different backgrounds. At the beginning, we had many people who graduated from University of Art, but now we have student, we have people who graduated from Kyoto University, Waseda University, or Joji University, which have nothing to do with art like computer programmers or SF writers, science, science fiction authors. There are many different talents in Sandwich. Being distant from urban areas, we are trying to reflect what's happening in urban areas. What I mean is that commercial rules or commercial consumption cycles are something which are away from us because we are feeling sense of crisis about that kind of urban uh, living or consumption styles. That's how I started my career. So those are members at the Sandwich Studio. When I take a close look at them, I can say that they actually go through that kind of a this kind of a filter and get together in the same common understanding. Ask that question around education because it's a nice segue also into introducing Greg Zvorak, um, our next uh, speaker. And you can start to switch places if you like um, while I, oh, you're gonna do it from here? Oh no, okay, oh perfect, okay. He's gonna sit where he is. Um, so Greg is a professor of international cultural studies at Waseda University. Um, he has an incredible project called Project 35, which is a grassroots network that he founded, which aims to raise awareness about the Pacific Islands region in Japan through art and scholarly knowledge. He has authored several books, one in 2018 on post-colonial Pacific history called Coral and Concrete, um, and he lectures res regularly on art and resistance in Oceania. In addition to all of this, he curated the public projects as part of ACK, so a lot of the artworks you see in between spaces, in between booths, were um, curated by Greg, um, working very closely with the artists and the galleries. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Greg to speak for about 10 minutes. All right. Thank you very much, Aaron, and thank you, uh, Nawa Sensei. Um, it's quite a pleasure to be here. It's quite intimidating to speak after such a uh, very influential and important artist uh, today. But um, I also am an educator. I'm a person who works with students, with young people. Um, and um, my practice kind of um, as a curator is a very recent uh, development in my own career, in my own life path. Um, but it comes out of really thinking about how society um, is obviously very influenced by art, and art is very influenced by society. And how do we think about issues of power and accountability um, in the world today? And uh, I've been teaching um, at a number of universities, particularly at Waseda University, where I'm a full professor um, for the past uh, roughly 15 years. And one of the things that always struck me as I deal with issues of history, of um, colonialism, thinking about militarism, a lot of issues that really matter in our world. And I think uh, something that is also in some ways a theme of what we're talking about today, ecology and environment, climate change. I've noticed that uh, sometimes scholarly work has its limits in terms of really reaching the public and communicating some of these issues and, and thinking through some of these problems. And my impression of art in Japan, contemporary art in Japan, is that it's so powerful and so rich and so well 
um, cultivated and refined and uh, practiced. There's so many artists who have a lot of skill. And yet I think one of the gaps that we have in Japan in our ed art education or the art sort of ecosystem or ecology here is maybe a lack of engagement with some of the deeper research around these social issues. So that I often find um, my own students at Waseda University in a very academic setting struggling to engage with some of these deeper creative issues and narratives in, in the world. And I think a lot of art students, I've had the privilege of also teaching at Kyoto uh, Geidai, formerly Kyoto Zoke University, I found that they also struggled to, to, to engage with real world problems. They were concerned, they wanted to make some sort of a difference. In some ways, I think every artist is political. Every artist is in some ways an activist, however they look at it. Um, and I found that part of my place could be to help mediate in those spaces. Um, if I could talk a little bit about my background and why I got to this point. Um, I have a strange background, which is better illustrated with visuals. Um, I have lived in Japan for most of my life, but um, I am American and I spent my early childhood uh, in the Marshall Islands, which is there in the middle of the Pacific. Um, this is, these are the Pacific Islands um, of Oceania. Um, this is actually part of Micronesia. I grew up um, for a significant part of my early childhood on an island called Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands, uh, which is part of the largest atoll in the world. And as you can see, there's a lot of military infrastructure there. That's partly because this place was colonized by Japan for 30 years um, in a period that was known as the, the Nanyo Gunto. Uh, it was a space of um, colonial settlement and militarization eventually by Japan, which um, was part of what led, a, led up to World War II. And then later it was colonized by the United States for well over 50 years and is now an independent country. And yet this base still remains. So for me, my father was a, a person who worked as a civilian testing missiles for the United States military, um, as many fathers and mothers did on that island. And I was always richly aware that there were always Marshallese people around us, displaced indigenous people. And so it got into my mind very early on that there was something a little bit wrong with this situation. Um, so me personally, as uh, an artist to some degree, ha that's always been something in my mind, but also that led me into academia. For example, how can we think about the connections between the Japanese period, where local people learn Japanese, and many elders still do speak Japanese, and have very ambivalent but interesting kind of memories about that time and today? where as a child, for example, I would climb on Japanese war fortifications, and that was part of my environment. So when we talk about an, an art ecology actually creating a new ecology, I think it's very important, but we also have to think about the ecology that exists around us already, and we have to think about history and engage with that. I have given many lectures in many places, and for many years, I would always show this kind of slide, where I would show one of the nuclear tests that was conducted in Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, one of the 67 devastating atomic bombs that was detonated by the United States Department of Energy um, there and also in Enuetak Atoll. And I would always notice the audience would go, oh, and they would look and there would be a moment of sort of this awe at the sublime, at these kind of violent images. And I realized, you know, even as a scholar, how am I reproducing this kind of violence and eliciting some sort of a sexy response from my audience with this kind of violence. And it made me think more deeply, how can I engage with art and with artists, and particularly to engage with artists from the region? How do they talk about these kinds of issues? And it led me actually sort of naturally into working as a curator. Um, I had the privilege of working very closely with this amazing woman, Kathy Jetnel Kijner, who is the most prominent contemporary artist from the Marshall Islands. She has the um, family background and the positionality to be able to speak about a lot of the nuclear testing, but also about climate change. And she has worked as a climate change activist. She has addressed the United Nations. And yet she's an incredible poet, filmmaker, um, installation artist, and also a weaver. <laughs> um, and um, so working with her, I gradually began to uh, collaborate on different kinds of projects. One of these was uh, the Air Canoe exhibit, which we put together uh, partly 
Uh, I was a co-curator on a project at the uh, 10th Asia Pacific Triennial in Brisbane, Australia. This is just last year, or it finished last year. Um, I won't go into too much depth, but there's a lot of work in that that might normally be marginalized as just being sort of craft or traditional kind of heritage work that is not seen as contemporary art. And yet, talking about this kind of um, connection to the world and how people might think about um, interacting and, and reframing art led us eventually, I was involved with Kathy to bring um, 30 uh, people to the Marshall Islands. Um, this is a bit too complicated to talk about in the time that I have right now. But between my students at Waseda University, kind of teaching, getting them engaged and thinking about these sorts of things, also having a chance to talk and um, uh, speak with art students here in Kyoto. Um, this seemed like a natural progression when I was invited to be involved in this project. It has many difficulties. We're still kind of unpacking this. This is just from two months ago, but in Bikini Atoll. What happens when you bring 30 international artists, or actually 20 international artists, um, 20 mar young Marshallese, Marshallese artists into this kind of space together. How do they deal with that landscape? How do they think about that kind of space? What happens when you go to Bikini Atoll, to Rongalap Atoll? These are intensely irradiated, fraught landscapes. Um, and it brought up a lot of questions. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into those right now, but I just think that um, this kind of thing is very daring. Uh, one of the artists with us is uh, Arai Takashi, a Japanese artist who was nominated to come from Japan. Um, I would like to do more of these kinds of things. My project, Sango, is also written 35, uh, is like Sango, the coral, thinking about the metaphors of how people connect over these kind of reefs, the cultural reefs that we create together. And so I love what uh, Nawasan does. I love what you do. I think this kind of residency kind of work, bringing people together. But if I could contribute one other piece of this conversation, it's how do we engage with place and how do we engage with history? Because these things do not happen in a vacuum, and art doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I think, especially when we're, when we're in an art fair like this, where art is so aestheticized and commodified, part of my job here was to hack this art fair. That's part of what I'm trying to do with this public program, is to introduce these glitches, to raise questions around what art is actually doing. So I think I'll leave it at there, but that's kind of where I'm at in my own journey. I have no solutions, no clear answers about what this was about yet, but it generated some amazing conversations. And every single person here has been invited to make art in an international exhibition that we have a lot of funding for in the next couple of years. So watch this space. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Colonialism and military nations, those are the things that are giving us uncom uncomfortable realities in a world that is still having negative impact on a society. Japan, at the Second World War, suffered from atomic bomb at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Kyoto was originally the target of the atomic bomb. Kyoto was one of the candidates of the target, but it so happened that Nagasaki and Hiroshima were selected as target city. That's our history. After the atomic bombing in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the impact on people and impact on the plants and animals, all those samples were collected by the US and those information and data were utilized by the US to create another weapons. Japan is the only nation in the world who suffered from atomic bomb. So what do you think about the place, uh, Japan, Kyoto, as a place to do your activity? Let me speak in Japanese, I mean English.
Quite a lot, actually, as, as both a historian and a person who works with art in many ways. Um, I want to elaborate on what you just said, that in fact, I think the perception is that Japan is one of the only places that's really experienced the trauma of nuclear weapons. But in fact, all of the places where nuclear uh, all of the, sub the uranium work, for example, we have in our audience two artists who've worked with the topic of uranium, Ken and Julia Yonetani. Um, the mining, the actual refinement, the creation of, the testing of these kinds of weapons has also caused incredible harm throughout our world. So I think that needs to be said, especially in a place like the Marshall Islands and French Polynesia where so many people are still suffering today with never being able to go home or not even being able to deal with these kinds of issues. But I think in the, in the, the Japan we live in now, not just Japan, in this Japan, there is a lot of amnesia and it's selective amnesia. So for example, it's so important to remember the pain of hibakusha, the people who have you know, experienced this kind of trauma. And I think it, it falls on creatives and educators to be able to keep those kinds of memories alive. So they're very important. But at the same time, I think that sometimes what art can do is it can begin to kind of complicate the story, to remind people to think about the complexities. The United States did horrible things to Japan, not just with nuclear weapons, but the kind of dehumanizing way that it attacked Japan during the war. I mean, complete cities were burned with horrible kinds of weapons, including conventional weapons as well. But I think what's really important here is to think about how we, our, our, our histories sometimes do not include the bigger picture. For example, Japan also was very involved with some very difficult and very complicated kinds of engagements that were violent and sometimes very caring also in the Pacific and in other places that Japan colonized. So I think about Kyoto as a place that has, you know, so many different wars. Before Corona, you know, there was a major plague here that led to the Gion Matsuri, for example, right? I mean, there are very interesting histories that we can tap into, that can nurture us, and that can give us interesting solutions. But what saddens me is, as an educator, as a professor in Japan, I'm sure you feel this too to some extent, many of our students don't know those histories, and they don't learn about the complexity of them. So I feel that a site like Kyoto, where this kind of history is valued and nurtured, is a place where we can actually confront some of those things, and art can help us to confront those kinds of issues in creative and sometimes playful ways, that they can open up different kinds of pathways um, that might not be easy, you know, for politicians to deal with. So this is, this is my hope. You know, I think in Japan, this is something that we can do together in <laughs> different ways to kind of get our students to be more engaged and not be afraid of these difficult conversations. And I think art allows people to overcome that fear. That's kind of my thought, but I have a lot more to say. <laughs> I think you are right. The wars and also trauma from the atomic weapons have given a deep impact on artists in Japan. The art history after the World War II is very much influenced by that experience. In 2011, we had East Japan earthquake. Of course, it was a tragic experience, and that was followed by the, um, the incident. The incidents. Uh, the, after the incident of the nuclear power plant, we had meltdown. And then we had China syndrome. We imagined a material which melt down and go deep into the earth. That was the imagination uh, at the basis of my artwork. So the world is very complicated, and the artist feels something, and we are trying to create something out of that feeling. And Japanese artists tend to feel that incident and the history, and through our body we are trying to create an artwork so that we can reveal something through the art or send message through the art. So 
so when we look at those art pieces from different countries, we may be able to find out that there is a uniqueness to Japan, an originality to Japan. Thank you. I could just say one more thing. I, I love what you just said, and I think the way I often say some of what you just articulated is that the nation of Japan is troubling in some ways, but as an archipelago, right? This is an archipelago of 7,000 islands that's diverse and complex and amazing. And I think artists have a way of really being able to see that and bring that forth. So I, I think that's, you know, if we can recognize that they're different things, it's a, it's a nice way of starting something else, not a new conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so again, I'm Aaron uh, Cesar, and it's great to kind of like almost pick up and then now build up from this conversation by looking at kind of the international context in terms of thinking of this notion of building ecosystems. Um, it's very much at the core of what I do at Delfina Foundation, which is kind of based in London. Um, I describe our work in many different ways. I describe us first as a house or really as a home for artists, for curators, and sometimes collectors as well, to be in residence, to live together, to think, to cook, to make art. Um, we are also a, a place that um, I like to also describe as a connector. So partnerships are very much at the core of all of our work creating relationships with institutions, but also with communities. I also describe our work as a platform in terms of offering opportunities for artists and curators and other thinkers to have their work seen through exhibitions, through talks, through debates, through performances. I'll first just show you just some images of the space kind of itself. We occupy not a huge building, as, as big as Sandwich, um, but it's about 500 square meters uh, in London. We have a library. Um, we do a lot of events uh, that involve convivial experiences, so eating together and cooking together. Um, we do this event called Family Lunch every two weeks at Delfina Foundation, where we invite leading museum directors, curators, collectors, to eat a meal with our artists. And over this meal, over this, um, this uh, coming together, is a conversation around art and society. Um, of course, we offer spaces for making, um, for exhibiting work, for screenings, as well as uh, performances. We are based in central London, so we're the small DF, which is just below Buckingham Palace. We are about 200 meters from Buckingham Palace. So we are at the heart of the city, at the seat of power that we were discussing, in a city that once was the head of one of the world's largest empires, in a city that once was part of the European Union. So we bring artists and thinkers to this space, to the seat of power, to occupy that place and to think about art and what art means and what's the capacity for art to try and, as Greg was saying, debunk some of the notions of power or to question uh, the colonial or to decolonialize thinking. Um, but to also look at art as a way of bringing people together across different divides. Um, our residencies at Delfina tend to cluster or, or, or come together around certain subject matters, certain research areas, one of which is the politics of food. And as part of this program, we have engaged with many different communities and different types of practitioners from bakers to cheesemakers, um, community gardeners. And it's been one of our most accessible programs whereby um, you can engage with audiences on a, very, on a very different level and open up a very different conversation about culture, 
about art because you're talking about food, something that we all have a relationship to. But the politics that lie therein become uh, a way in which we can really grapple with some of the world's biggest challenges. So our, our last edition of the politics of food dealt with the environmental um, emergency that we're all dealing with now. Another area relates to science, technology, and society in terms of bringing together practitioners to exchange ideas around these different subjects. Another is performance. Um, we call it performance as process. So looking at performance as a way of understanding the world around us. Um, in this case, this is an event in the British Museum um, in one of the most contested galleries, where the Duvine, this is the Duvine galleries, where the Elgin marbles from Greece are. Um, and it's an incredible performance with abled and disabled or differently abled uh, individuals. Um, it, performances are also a way to uh, rethink rituals and how we um, consider um, certain practices around us, so it's not just about live art, although we do do live art. And this is one of the largest platforms that we have taken um, some of our work, some of our thinking to. Um, this is the Venice Biennale, where I co-curated the performance program in 2019. This is Nastio Mosquito in the Gardens of the Giardini. This is Zadie Cha, also in the same location. And the American uh, artist Solange Knowles. Um, I'm going to end here with this final area of research that we've been investigating called collecting as practice. So looking at the politics of collecting, the philosophy of collecting, and the psychology of collecting. I end here because we are in an art fair. Um, and so um, we are also kind of questioning the value of art, not in terms of the financial value, but the social value. So part of this program has engaged artists who collect, who build archives as part of their practices. This is the Korean artist, Kim Young Jung. Um, this is her collection of objects that she often uses to uh, perform with. Um, now she's considering them more as a collection um, within her work. Uh, the project has also involved us intervening in museums and galleries. Um, this is an Indian artist, uh, Avni Tanya, who, had a, who was in residence in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And during her time there, she was looking at the South Asian collection in particular. And she had a lot of questions and concerns about the South Asian collection, which was born from the colonial period. And, 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 in, and even today, how they're displayed caused some concerns and questions. So she produced an alternative guide to the South Asian collection, which is now available in the V&A bookshops. And this is with the full support of the institution, a form of institutional critique that they have completely, completely kind of taken on board. And lastly, we have hosted collectors in residence alongside artists. And this has been to, to, to look at ways in which or how, let's say, is to look at how, or what role, I should say, what role collectors also play in society alongside artists. If you're going to talk about the whole ecosystem, then you have to look at every single aspect of it. And so with collectors, we've been creating a space for them to think about how to take their private passion into the public domain. So increasingly, it's been about these individuals producing public initiatives, um, in some cases, a private museum, in other cases, thinking about how they can support institutions that already exist to make a much bigger impact. And I'm going to leave it there um, in terms of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to think of you know, all of those different components of, of this ecosystem and how they play out in such a place of centrality and, and power, you know, that, that you, you're kind of bringing all of these people together into conversation around everyday things like meals and, um, and the very meaning of kind of residence. Uh, it sounds like you're, uh, as you talked about the, the occupation, I really like that term. And I'm wondering, I guess, about two things in, in relation to this occupation and how 
bringing collectors into these spaces and also bringing artists and curators and so forth, how they relate to the local. I'm thinking about locality because you mentioned um, sort of empire or the metropole, right? <clears throat> and London obviously is a metropole. Tokyo is a metropole. Kyoto is also a kind of metropole, right? And as you can see in, in my work, I'm trying to bring people into very local spaces. We often say in Pacific studies, and I think this is true in many post-colonial spaces, that it's about the translocal. How, do, how does local connect with local? So I'm wondering, what are the stakes involved in bringing people together? How do you choose the people that come into these spaces from different localities? How do they bring their local into your local in London and also the global of that sort of imperial sort of space? Um, very interesting question and something that we are continuously grappling, grappling with. Well, it's the same that as, as you're, any, any time you're doing this, this work on the local level and you're engaging with um, the, the community, which in also includes us, by the way. But as you know, we're all individuals and we change from one minute to the next. So how you approach and engage with the community also has to be adaptable in that, that kind of way. Um, we have had artists and practitioners and residents from 90 different countries kind of around the world. And many of uh, our artists or, the, or curators reflect communities that are also in London because it is such a global city. So for us, it's trying to find those connections that can happen between diasporic communities and, and, and artists who are coming from another, another place. A good example of this is a project that we initiated with Tate and also the artist Ahmet Ogut. He's a Turkish artist, Turkish-Kurdish artist. I should be clear about that. Um, and the artist created a project called The Silent University, which is about engaging refugees and asylum seekers in the UK within an arts context to look at and reflect on their role within society and how they are effectively silenced through the process of trying to become an, a citizen and also seeking refuge kind of in the UK, and also how we, the, as I say we as on, on behalf of the UK, are, are creating a barrier for them to fully engage because many of these individuals come with huge professional accreditations. They come as doctors, lawyers, university professors, but the moment they step into the UK, they cannot work until their visa or their is, is approved, until they become a citizen. And so there's also a loss to the economy of our system of immigration. And so the project was to try and create a way to acknowledge this, this information gap and create a, through, through creating a knowledge exchange kind of platform. And what we found in this project, A was as an organization that works with artists, um, many artists, so we work with about 40 artists a year for three month periods. We have to work with partners who can maintain the ongoing relationship with the community because it would be inappropriate to parachute an artist in and out of a space. So how do you maintain that relationship? So for us, it's with the Migrants Resource Center, which is a, an organization that operates in our local community, um, but they operate with all of London. And so finding those, those links, I think, so maybe to answer your question, it's about the notion of collaboration always within this. Yeah. And recognize it on many different levels, how, how it happened with individuals, but also how it happens directly with communities. And if I could add one more thing there, it sounds like there's, there's also an axis of time, right? So there's a sense of how does that relationality, how do those relationships perpetuate? How do you continue them, right? Which gets into the question of the archive, right? So how does, if you're talking about being a family, how does this family remember itself as you go on? How does that, how do you imagine that into the future or going back? Yeah. Again, a great, very relevant question for us because we are constantly thinking about this, the notion of our archive and the legacy for, for us as an organization. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that the themes that I presented, the research areas, so politics of food, collecting as practice, these are themes that we've done over many, many, many years. So effectively, the institution has become the repository of knowledge that it's helped to generate. Often what happens with residency programs is that artists come into a process, maybe into a community, and they leave. And often when they leave, they may leave a seed, they may leave something behind, but they're often taking to another place. And so we wanted to create 
a, a, an approach that would mean that some of what they brought was really uh, settling, almost like sediment, kind of into our work as a foundation. And therefore, it wouldn't just be extractive. You know, it could also have that ability to also transfer and go to other places, but something remained. And over time, like over five or six years of the politics of food, we've built a bigger community around this work. There's 120 artists uh, who've been in residence just around the politics of food as a theme. And now we're considering now how do we use this community in other contexts? So how do we expand it? How we, through other collaborations, if that makes sense. Um, I'm also noticing, Greg, that we are now short on time. So I wanted to kind of take the liberty, if it's okay with my fellow panelists, to open the floor. If there are any questions from the audience, please put your hand up. There's a microphone that we passed around. And then in between your questions, we might ask each other questions as well. So we have one person in the front here, please. Thank you. Uh, um, very, thank you so much for today's presentations. I'm really, really like so pl privileged to be here. And I, um, can I ask in English? It's okay. I don't yeah. speak Japanese, so okay. Um, I, I have uh, two questions. It's but the both are related to the localities. And the first question for you, because you're talking about the, this residency program. Can I call it as a residency program in Marshall Island or? A re did you call it residency? Yeah. It, I think we could, yeah. It's like a residency at sea. It was an experiment, but yes. Okay, because uh, I found it that's a very much fascinating idea, but the thing is, it has very much specific special background or micro histories. Yes. And that you're saying that you're inviting international artists, and how could you proceed with this? It's a the, uh, flipping question. How could you... Um, proceed this locality with this intentional uh, international artists together because they are like they're not from there and uh, I don't yeah. insert or hurt the other people because I'm actually an outsider and then but I'm trying to engage to the community but how could it happen I mean uh, yeah. and that was the fundamental question so thank you it for is. bringing that up <laughs> and if I start talking about that it's going to take a week Please. Um, but so very briefly that's actually one of the biggest questions that's emerged. And you know, I knew from the beginning, I was, I was actually not one of the main organizers, I was part of the advisory team for this, but um, it, it was actually really to have the Marshall Islanders actually lead. That they were, they were that, that everything, all of the protocols were handled properly so that all accountability towards localities, to traditional leadership, to all kinds of other cultural protocols were all taken care of and very valued and very clearly communicated. Mm -hmm. So it's always about integrity and it's always about that kind of ethics okay. and about thinking about the power relationships. Okay. So that, just to give you an example, some of the artists began, to, even though they cared, they were very concerned and interested in this space, but some of the artists began to do some pretty weird things. <laughs> they might be fine in a gallery, they might be fine on the stage somewhere here in this kind of space, but in the Marshall Islands, they did not make sense and they were inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And so local people had a platform to speak up and say, we didn't know what that was about. Can you talk about your intentions? Okay. And part of being on a boat is that no one can get off. <laughs> so the artists had to sit there and yeah, engage in conversation. Mm -hmm. And although it was uncomfortable, I think that's, that sense of discomfort might be something we need sometimes, mm -hmm. is to really get into those spaces and have those difficult conversations. So I felt it was a start, if I can say that, yeah. Okay, that makes, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. And then Aaron, I have a question because I know already before that the, the Finland Foundation is very much like one of the biggest rising foundation. But the thing is, you say that we are not a foundation, we are family. And then the interestingly, because for me it was like, ah, uh, you're saying that you're not non-institutional foundation, or how? The, but the thing is, we know we all the like famous or the established uh, residences, so hard to get in. And then when you're saying that you're family, then who decide to get uh, be accepted? And then. Uh, for example, I'm going to apply for next month, then who going to decide, oh, you're my family or not? And that you guys decide together for next generation or how going to be this um, process? Maybe to private 
intimacy questions, but I'm very interested in the so transparency. So. When um, also transparency. But anyway, I'll, I'll first just talk about the notion of family just a little bit, in that. Um, I think that Delfina Foundation, maybe you can tell me, because you'll, you'll find out later, in terms of how we approach kind of subject matter and how we build a community around us is through thinking of the notion kind of of a family in, in, place, in terms of creating a space that is kind of warm, that is convivial, and something that, that is long lasting. So once an artist has received the residency with us, that relationship continues way beyond the three month period they were kind of part of. And also same with our patrons too. We also consider them part of the family because they're supporting and enabling kind of the work that we're doing, but also they have, it's not just about money, it's also about mm -hmm. time, expertise, mm -hmm. and energy that you're bringing to, to something. In terms of the selection process, so we have a very kind of like rigorous kind of selection process kind of at the foundation. Some of the residencies we do are with partners and we then collaborate on the selection process. Some are not with partners and we, our team kind of decides. Mm -hmm. We have the most um, challenging prospects each time we have to do a selection because we are considering the group that we're creating, mm -hmm. not just the, we're not selecting just on the individual, we're thinking of how the eight residents together who will be in residence together will create another family unit, if that makes sense. So we're thinking about the kinds of practices, the kinds of experiences, the kind of knowledge that each of you will share in this house. Alongside that, we're also thinking of opportunity. It's a very big thing for us, is to think through what we're offering to that artist or that to, to, and to, that, to that curator, as well as what they're offering us, you know, what they're bringing to this, this space exactly. But in terms of opportunity, it's a very big thing for us, because sometimes we don't select the best artists. Sometimes we're selecting artists who's not as good, partially because we see the potential in what they're doing, and maybe they haven't had the opportunity Maybe they haven't had formal education. Maybe they haven't had an, a lot of residencies. Maybe they've never left their country. And so therefore we're thinking, well actually this person, you know, this will give them, the, the, you know, uh, this will be a stepping stone for them kind of in their career. And then sometimes we are choosing the best because in some way they, they're, they, they're still challenged by, they, they still will be challenged by their time in London. So it's always a huge, huge debate and I always say to artists if you don't receive the residency upon applying the first time apply again and there are many stories of artists who applied three and four times and then they got it and actually it was the right time for them and they even reflected on that it's actually now I'm actually ready for this whereas and because we're yeah anyway it just we're juggling a lot but it's not an easy because it's not a straightforward objective or not a straightforward even subjective type of thing we've selected many artists whose work Let's say the, the actual artwork is something that maybe doesn't necessarily appeal to me, my personal taste. But I have to remember that we are, no, no, but we're an institution, right? So you're actually trying to select for the many audiences that are out there in the world, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, Aaron, I'm, I'm told to keep it short, but my question it was to be very short anyway. Yes, for you. Beautiful what you just said, the, uh, the potential you just said now. How does it manifest itself? <laughs> well, there's so many examples that I could kind of like offer to you about the potential. How does it manifest itself? I think what we're often looking at is um, how the, well, I think what, 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 where we see it is when we do the interviews. So we will interview, we'll make a short list of applications and we'll do interviews. And in interviews is very different because when an artist has to write something down on paper and describe their work in something that might be solely visual or social, it breaks down sometimes. But given an opportunity to talk directly you know, about their practice, you can see within this their ability to engage you know, with, let's say, external uh, individual, external people like a community. You can also see their drive and their hunger, you know, for that experience, which also matters a lot. And also, what you also can kind of identify is um, the, um, the, the prospects for them growing. And I, I say that in a very, 
maybe I'm sounding very, very flowery from my description of that, but um, I'll give you an example. Um, we, many years ago, invited an artist from Brazil um, who grew up in a favela, makes incredible work, um, but never really had significant opportunity um, from kind of his context. And um, being in the UK opened up so many, we, we could see that being in the UK would open up so many you know, opportunities for him and ideas because what he was producing back at home would really resonate with, we felt, a UK-based audience. And also for him to see his work taken from a very local context into an international context would also open up these possibilities. And we were, you know, absolutely right in this kind of context because although it was his first time ever abroad, he somehow found a community that helped him flourish. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm, I don't want to go into too much details. I'm really sorry about that, but we can talk after this uh, <laughs> about, about this. Sorry, Sean, to be there. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm afraid the time has come, so we would like to close uh, this session. So uh, thank you very much, Adon Cezal-san, Greg Dovolzak-san, and uh, Nawa uh, Sensei. Thank you very much.